Hi, folks, and welcome to our Sunshine Coast World Oceans Day Festival and our final talk in our 2023 NEMO Talk series. I'm Suzanne Sanger, the Executive Director of the Sunshine Coast Conservation Association. The SCCA is partnering with Rhizome Up Media and the Green Film Series with funding from the District of Seashell, Sunshine Coast Regional District, and Sunshine Coast Credit Union to bring you this year's festival. The SCCA works to protect lands and waters on the Sunshine Coast in the territories of the Squamish, Seashell, Pliamen, Klahus, and Homolko First Nations. We are deeply grateful to the First Nations of this area for stewarding these lands and waters since time immemorial. We take great inspiration from the respect reverence and connection that Indigenous peoples have always had with nature, and it is in this spirit of connection that we bring you the World Oceans Day Festival. Every year on June 8th, people all around the world come together to celebrate World Oceans Day, um, and the United Nations designated this day to inform the global public of the impact of human actions on our oceans and, and to develop and mobilize a worldwide movement of citizens for the ocean. The theme of this year's program is planet ocean, tides are changing. As our planet and waters warm and seas rise, we, we really have to join forces to tackle these changes and the challenges together. Our festival program includes in-person and online screenings of thought-provoking and inspiring feature and short films, interactive citizen science activities, and our Nemo Talk series all of which are intended to inspire, enlist, and connect people in our community and beyond to take action to protect our oceans. Today, we are very excited to have Leanne Ennis with us uh, for our last talk in the series. Um, and we're gonna hear from Leanne about, how, about sea kelp ecosystems, their role as foundational habitat and food for a diverse range of marine species and an array of ecosystem and climate mitigation services. Leanne is joining us from Zwil Kwai, Half Moon Bay, where she lives with her husband, Scott, and children, Sophia and Charlotte. They have always lived and played on the ocean, and each of them has a special connection with the sea. Leanne is a UVic alumni, having studied marine biology at University of Victoria and Bamfield Marine Sciences Center on the west coast of Vancouver Island. For Leanne, Bamfield was a transformative learning experience where she would recommend, uh, which she would recommend for any young biologist. Yeah. While at Bamfield, she learned how to cultivate red algae and kelp, not realizing then how important that would become today. Leanne is best known to the Sunshine Coast community for her years of dedication and delivery of nature school education programs at the Iris Griffith Interpretive Center. Most recently, she has been cultivating kelp for an aquaculture lease on Nelson Island, and she is now planning to apply these techniques to an upcoming kelp restoration project. Leanne wants to share her experiences with us today and hopefully inspire others to take action to protect and restore our connections with the ocean. I'm gonna invite Leanne to please share your screen. Um, oh. and Thanks, hey, Suzanne, that was yeah. very kind. I'm gonna- Take it away. Okay, let's see here. Ooh, there we go. Thanks so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, that was a very nice introduction. And I just have to applaud the SCCA for all that you've done with Nemo Talks and all the World Oceans Day uh, events that have happened on the coast this week. And that happened year round. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. I am here in Half Moon Bay in Wilkwe with my family <clears throat> looking out at the ocean and spending a lot of time on it uh, every day. And um, I wanted to share with you um, the last few years that I've been studying kelp. And um, first of all, I'll start with a little introductory slide in case somebody would like to jot down my email real quick, because I invite anybody who's interested to reach out, give me an email, um, follow me on social media and get involved. There'll be plenty of ways to get involved. Um, for today's talk, I wanted to hit on three themes. Uh, why is kelp important? Why are we losing kelp? And how can we help kelp? Uh, there's a lot of you know, negative um, stories in the news these days with fires burning and um, warming oceans, but I have to uh, be here to give some the next generation some hope that there are ways that we can make change. 
But let's start off with why is kelp so important? Kelp is very important because it covers one quarter of the Earth's uh, shorelines. Kelp is found in all hemispheres, both hemispheres and all, uh, along all continents. Um, bull kelp, which is a vertical kelp, laminarian kelp, um, provides essential habitat uh, to many fish, out-migrating out salmonids. It provides substrate for herring to spawn on. Um, and it's a primary producer, um, drawing down carbon, using the sun's energy to create this beautiful um, macrophyte, as we know it, bull kelp. There's a lot of different animals that rely on kelp for habitat uh, ecologically. Um, there's marine invertebrates that spawn on the kelp that use it for habitat. There's vertebrates, fish, and of course, there's otters. Um, in our region, otters are missing from the equation but there are other animals that rely on it very importantly. It's hard to study kelp because it's underwater. Um, so I often rely on a lot of my friends who are divers who um, can go down and have a good look to see what's happening. And some of those divers here on the Sunshine Coast have been um, diving and documenting kelp for many, many years. One of them is a gentleman named Neil McDaniel who has been studying uh, the inlets and has got his pulse on um, what the status of the kelp is in our region. He took this photo back in 2007 at Piper's Point and shows a really nice thick and diverse kelp forest. It's very important that um, we do everything we can to keep kelp going and um, it's been culturally important to First Nations for, for generations. It plays a key role in food security and um, at times kelp uh, provides that substrate for herring to spawn on. So herring is often um, talked about in the news as being depleted and declining. And we need to do everything we can to help the kelp and bring it back. Here's a little photo, another diver friend, Jeff Grognet, who took this photo in Seashelt Inlet. And uh, it's a little tiny bull kelp hanging on by a thread in amongst a sea of urchins. I'll get into that in just a moment. The diversity of the kelp species in Puget Sound and Salish Sea and Georgia Strait. Salish Sea is, is the body of water that encompasses Puget Sound and Georgia Strait. There's 22 laminarian kelps or brown kelps in the strait, but there's only two of them that are um, vertical, vertical kelps. So there's um, giant kelp and bull kelp, Nereocystis lutkiana. And the others are, are subtitle kelps that are attached to the bottom and um, they produce big leafy fronds. On the right hand side here, I have a photo of uh, a poster that Bridget Clarkson gave me from UBC and it shows a wide diversity of other seaweeds, including reds and greens. There's over 400 species of red seaweeds and many green seaweeds, but there's only 22 species of brown kelp in our waters. They're really hard to, to figure out um, the different species, but on close inspection, the one on the left here is actually Costeria castata. It's also known as five ribbed kelp. It's a beautiful kelp. And the one on the right here is Alaria mar uh, marginata and has a midrib down the center. These kelps are held on by a holdfast. They have a stipe and they have a frond. So they're important primary producers. They provide food and shelter, as I mentioned earlier, especially to those fish, those important fish species. And um, it's okay if you don't know how to identify some of these species because you can download an app on your phone called the Seaweed Sorter app, which helps me out quite a bit. <clears throat> For $3.99 in the app store, you can be a seaweed expert yourself. And so this, this app is curated by Dr. Patrick Martone up at UBC. And it, it's a really useful tool for, um, it's like a dichotomous key and it asks you questions, yes and no answers about the branching patterns of, of different various seaweeds and kelps and gets you down to um, identifying the species that you're looking at. So these kelps are very important. There's different pages of the Seaweed Sorter app. Why are we losing kelp? 
it's unfortunate that uh, it's a kelp emergency right now. Some of my friends at SFU have declared a kelp emergency. There's uh, physical stressors, biological stressors, and human caused uh, stressors to our kelp emergency. Um, marine heat waves are causing a lot of stress on a few of the species that interact with kelp. So, so we've had sea star wasting disease has come from the marine heat waves. Uh, following marine heat waves in 2013 and 2014, we experienced this huge massive die off of sea stars up and down the coast of North America. And this is the biggest die off of any species uh, known to date in the ocean. Following the sea star wasting disease die off, um, there was an overabundance of sea urchins. So the herbivores, the spiky sea urchins exploded in numbers and they are busy grazing kelp. And we're at the point now where the kelp forests are in, in dire need of our help. Another other human caused, um, human caused stressors are pollution, global warming, which is causing ocean acidification. Our oceans are absorbing that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the ocean's becoming more acidic. Shoreline development is also causing um, sedimentation and runoff into the ocean and at times over harvesting of, of kelp. But um, the main one I wanna focus on today, the marine heat waves, it's really unfortunate that we've had a few of those. The Salish Sea is unusually warm. It's up to two degrees warmer than the outside coast. And so the kelp in this region is experiencing extreme stress from marine heat waves, and it's affecting the ability for the kelp to reproduce. So at temperatures above 18 degrees sea surface temperature, the kelp is um, kelp seed is actually failing. It's unfortunate. Um, and the sea star wasting disease, we lost this top predator, the Pycnopodia, the sunflower star, Again, this is a reference to sea stars of the Pacific Northwest. Our friend Neil McDaniel has hosted this beautiful website about sea stars. If you'd like to learn more about this top predator, Pycnopodia. In the absence of the Pycnopodia, the sea urchins exploded. And this is unfortunately what it looks like at times along the rocky shorelines of Seashelf Inlet. It's just loaded with urchins. Um, recently in the cover of <clears throat> Nature Conservancy magazine. They wanted to explain this in, in a graphic uh, illustration. We're calling it a sea urchin invasion. And when the sea, the Pycnopodia sunflower star um, is depicted in this little fun, quirky illustration as being, um, being the, the most important um, top predator of the sea urchin. Sorry, I'm struggling a little bit here, but I'll, I'll get, regain my composure. <laughs> okay, so Pycnopodia would eat the sea urchin and deal with those, those sea urchins that we just saw a few moments ago that are exploding. So in the absence of Pycnopodia, the kelp is being grazed. Pycnopodia was recently listed as critically endangered internationally. And um, luckily, the coastline of British Columbia has wonderful fjords and refugia for Pycnopodia. So there's a few left up our inlets and the geography is so interesting along the coast of BC that a few of them have hung on and diver friends are reporting now that they are starting to see a recovery of Pycnopodia. Other people are working on uh, rearing Pycnopodia in order to help the kelp forest come back so that this top predator will take care of those urchins. I was really interested in getting down to the nitty gritty of the life cycle of kelp. So I um, looked more closely about five years ago at the natural history of kelp and I wanted to learn about its, its life history. So I went looking for the sorus material of Nereocystis, which are these sorus patches. It matures as a macrophyte in June and July in the inlet. And these seed patches fall out of the kelp to the forest floor. And there's an alternation of generations. I'd like to show you. The seed patches come in many different shapes and sizes. Here are a few funny ones. Uh, I put this one in on the right. Uh, looks like a butterfly for my butterfly friends that are joining us today. And here's a funny faced Sora's patch. 
um, on the left. But the, the source patch is the seed material of the next generation. Here, this, this slide depicts the source patch falling out, releasing zoospores. The zoospores settle to the bottom of the ocean. They have a little flagella, they're flagellated zoospores, which is really bizarre. Um, they're motile and they almost are animal-like in characteristics. So um, I learned that the brown laminarian kelps actually have a fungal ancestor. They're not related to plants. You can't actually call brown kelps plants. They have a, the closest relative as a fungal ancestor, whereas red seaweeds and green seaweeds actually have a plant ancestor. These brown seaweeds do not. Um, the zoospores settle out to the bottom. They drop their tails, and then the male and female gametophytes uh, mature. I'm, I'm pointing at the male and female right here. And they have sex and produce a zygote. The zygote grows up a blade that becomes a macrophyte that we know in the next generation. If the male and female gametophytes can't find each other, then they're unsuccessful reproducing. So what we have here is, is a heteromorphic life cycle of microscopic and macroscopic uh, sporophyte. And so it's an alternating generation. Um, if those, the density of the kelp forest is low and those gametophytes can't find each other on the seafloor, then the macrophyte won't grow again. So what happens is the kelp forest, if you get to a critical um, contraction where there's fewer and fewer and fewer kelp that are feeding seed into the system, it becomes like a negative feedback loop and it won't reproduce again. So you might have gametophytes on the forest floor, but they can't produce the, the macrophyte unless they find each other to have sex. So that is an amazing thing that I learned. And I, I, I went back to my days in Banfield culturing red algae and kelp, and I started doing this again myself. So with the help of divers, again, I collected source material. I looked up protocols on cultivating kelps, and I started a seaweed nursery, a kelp nursery with aquariums and microscopes, which is my favorite thing to do. I love aquariums and microscopes. So I settled the seed onto these, I inoculated these spools of twine with the zoospores, and I followed the, the procedures for six weeks uh, with sterilized and filtered seawater, and I fed them nutrients until about week three, the little sporophyte developed on the seed string, and I could see it under a microscope. This was really exciting, and this is what it looks like at about uh, four weeks. Again, my friend Jeff shared that photo with me of the string, and I have a little video I'd like to play here for you. So this is the sporophytes on the seed string in an aquarium. <laughs> All right. I, when it's time, I pull those um, inoculated spools out of the aquarium. I place them in a bucket. I bring them out to an aquaculture lease. And uh, before I do that, I have another quick look under the microscope to see if they're forming rhizoids or holdfasts. And um, the little rhizoids are forming at about week six. And this is what they look like up close. So little gametophyte pom-poms there with sporophyte blades. I've also tried to inoculate uh, rocks and get the seeds to, to settle onto rocks that could be planted out. So on the left, I've got the seed string, straight, seed string on a spool. On the right, I've got uh, on gravel. And this is a technique I learned uh, from the Green Gravel Action Network down in Australia. So other people worldwide are working on the same problems as we. So um, just to recap, the macrophyte life phase on the right here with the spore release, those dark patches, the spores are released. And on the left, the microscopic phase with the little leaf blades. Uh, what does that look like out at the farm? Well, I call it um, bucket science. I'm doing bucket science. Three different species of kelp here. I've got a laria, 
Neriocystis and Saccharina that I've been able to cultivate. And um, on the right here, I've got a rock with a uh, bulk help hold fast, um, trying to attach them to rocks to plant them out. I plant the spools out in December, transferring the spool twine onto the rope. Um, the bottom slide here shows a picture of them developing in about January. And in about February, the bulk help start to show um, their bulbs. And when I come back in February of a year, to my excitement, I have eggs. Now I realize I, I have um, not pressed play on my presentation and I could have these pictures go big. So I think I'm going to do that. Please excuse me as I press a setting here. Let's see if this works. Play. Is that better? Do you like that? So yeah. what I have here are tube snout eggs Orlorhynchus flavidus is the species name of the tube snout. It's a schooling forage fish. And several of our other Nemo talks, uh, Will Duguid was talking about forage fish the other day and the importance of forage fish. Well, this is one more of those small feeder fish. Um, and every February and March, since I've been practicing this kelp cultivation, they come and spawn in January and February and into March in masses. So I get these nice, beautiful eggs on the kelp. Um, there's a picture of the tube snout and it's long and skinny and it schools. And here's a picture of the hold fast with an egg clump. And it's really wonderful. If I was to count how many eggs are, are being laid each season, it would be in the millions. And it's been like clockwork for five years. So I feel uh, really happy and optimistic that I've grown, you know, up to three, from 3,000 to 5,000 meters of kelp each season with millions and millions of eggs attached to that kelp. And I just wait for that um, egg, egg life cycle to, they hatch out of the eggs and off they go. And then I would trim my kelp if I wanted to harvest it for food, but generally I leave it for habitat. So I call it habitat provisioning. This is my friend, Ted, who has the aquaculture lease that has been uh, working with me, partnering on this project. And we're standing in front of uh, a crop of sugar kelp. There's a crop of Valeria behind us. This is another friend, Chris Campagnola, who's also partnering on the project. And he's interested in getting a food product to restaurants in Vancouver. So he has his area of interest and I have mine and mine is habitat provisioning for fish. <clears throat> they look pretty happy with their crop. There's one more crop of Valeria. And this is through uh, throughout the course of five years we've been doing this. I've um, started doing some more experimenting on different seeding methods, including this method we're trying right here. It's called direct seed. And I'm using an alginate binder combined with the seed and applying it to the line. So instead of um, seeding the twine and deploying the twine onto the rope, we're actually um, culturing the, the kelp in a tumble culture, loose, and then um, adding it in ratios of like three to one, two to one, one to one with an alginate binder, applying it to the rope, using a catalyst to cure the alginate, and then um, deploying it into the ocean. And that's a method called direct seeding. So we're practicing many different aquaculture techniques. And I'm then going to take these techniques to apply it to restoration. This worked really well. I was excited about this. Um, this is a species called the Laria marginata. And um, I was showing this slideshow to some young professionals down at Camp Elphinstone recently for Impact 5 um, conference. And I had a young woman from uh, uh, Inuvik come to me afterwards and she said, this is a kelp that grows in the Arctic that her elders love and prize. She said they rip the frond off of the midrib and the elders chew on the midrib. I'd like to play the name of this kelp in their language, in Oh, that's the wrong one. Here it is, excuse me. Isn't that nice? One nook. One nook. 
she was really excited to share that with me. She came up and she was just full of life and told me this is their favorite kelp in the Arctic. So there are, as I mentioned earlier, there are kelp on all the coastlines everywhere, including the Arctic. And um, it's important food. This is food security for people in the Arctic. This is an important food. All right. I, um, I presented my findings at a conference called the, the Salish Sea Ecosystem Conference in, um, it was online during COVID. And I, um, what I was trying to, to deliver here was the timing of the activities. Like, when does this all take place? I was really interested in when the seeding should happen and when the outplant should happen and when the habitat is being used by animals, by the fish. So I delivered this um, to a conference and really enjoyed sharing it with people across the border down in Puget Sound are also doing similar work. So we're able to to compare notes. Um, here's a slide of all my diver friends out helping. It takes a whole community to do this work. Don't do it alone. There's lots of helpers involved, including my daughter, Charlotte, holding this large piece of kelp here with me. This is Ella, uh, my neighbor. She's out in a rowboat here, checking out some kelp that we grew. And she's helping um, transfer the kelp off the line onto rocks with natural rubber bands and planting them out. There's Charlotte helping again. So I like to involve lots of young people in this project and show them different ways that we can help the kelp. Here's Camilla Hindmarch on the left. She just graduated from UVic, studied biology. And Callum uh, Riv on the right also finished a degree at UVic recently and came out to help. They're both very interested. I'm interested in hold fast and how the kelp attaches to the rock. So it's a chemical and a physical attachment. And I've been talking to um, a Maisie Roy Muser at UBC who is studying hold fast attachment. And Maisie sent me some. Um, electron micrograph photographs of this. Very, very interesting. Here's another video. Let's see if I can play this one. Okay. So what I've done there is I've attached, I've peeled the kelp off the kelp line. I've attached it to a rock with natural rubber bands. I've deployed it in the ocean and then come back a week or two later hold it up in my kayak to have a look at how that holdfast has attached. So it's the holdfast acts like a holdfast, but it's not true roots. There's no nothing being conducted up through the roots of, of this kelp. It's, it's just an attachment, a way that it hangs on in the, the current, the fast flowing current. Okay, here's another video. My friend Jeff has kindly gone down and taken a picture of that or video footage of that. Jeff's got an HD camera. He does an excellent job working in the film industry, documentary films. And he's showing here those kelp we deployed. Some of them have bore into the sand. This one has. And you'll, you'll see in just a moment, a picture of one that hasn't bored in, but those are cultivated kelp. And it, normally they wouldn't be found in a sandy environment, but I think that um, it's okay to plant them out in this manner because the urchins won't come across that sandy barrier. Urchins are not found on the sand. And so what we've provided here is a little bit of habitat. We're trying some techniques out, see how they work. I can pull that up and sure enough, it's attached within two or three weeks and it's being used by fish. Here's some kelp online underwater. So it's not exactly as a natural kelp forest would be, but over time, learning ways that we can get it attached, the alginate binder I showed you a few slides ago might be how I'm going to attach the kelp to the rocks or the direct seeding methods. This slide here shows um, my F1 generation and my F2 generation. So I wanted to know if the kelp that I cultivate can in fact mature and produce spores and reseed or enhance an area. So I collected up the spores from that first generation. And in the same season, I managed to get a second generation of kelp. 
So I, I seeded the F1 really early. It went to seed early, collected the seed and cultivated it again. And so I know that the kelp that I'm growing is reproductive. It is possible. But actually, I would I would like to take my kelp uh, seed from the wild to preserve the genetic diversity. But I wanted to know that the kelp I'm producing will, in fact, produce kelp, if that makes sense. Um, there's a lot of other people working on this problem of uh, kelp decline. One of them is uh, Banfield Marine Sciences Center, which I encourage all young people to check out. Super fun place. And um, they're applying kelp genomics, genetics, to these questions, trying to come up with thermally tolerant uh, kelp species. And uh, Banfield's owned and operated by five Western Canadian universities, UVic, UBC, SFU, U of C, U of A. So if young people find themselves um, attending one of those universities, they could do some of their undergraduate degree out at Banfield, would be highly recommended. Uh, friends at SFU are developing uh, cryopreservation seed banks for kelp. And so I've been um, collaborating with uh, Dr. Cheryl Bisgrove's lab and her postdoc, Liam Coleman, um, sending them some kelp seed and they've been practicing cryopreserving it. And Liam's managed to work out the protocols for preserving kelp seed and biobanking, saving that gen genetic diversity in case um, it does get wiped out. This is the most at-risk kelp in all of the West Coast is right here in the Salish Sea. So it's important we biobank and we work on restoration techniques to save our kelp. Um, further up the coast near Haida Gwaii, this is a project um, that's involving, oh, I'm so sorry. Excuse me, that's my friend Steve calling from the UK. He's a kelp researcher. <laughs> I have a picture of Steve in just a moment. I'll show you what he's up to. But these folks are in Haida Gwaii. They're involving the Coastal First Nations to do their um, surveys, do their collections, because Coastal First Nations are so closely um, connected to those ecosystems. And so there's a lot of knowledge that's transferred between the scientists and the First Nations. And so um, I really admire the work that they've done up there. Uh, Dr. Lynn Lee, I enjoy reading her work. And uh, other people are solving our, our urchin problem by eating their way out of it. Um, so the, a company named Urchinomics from Norway, and they've gone to Japan and they're urchin ranching. And they're cult uh, collecting up the urchins that are problem urchins putting them in, in these ranching trays, feeding them a protocol for one month to bring their gonads or those, those eggs uh, up to top quality uni, which is served in fancy restaurants. Another company named Sumerai in California are doing the same. And I do this with my husband. We head out to Skookumchuk and we uh, bring some rice and we roll up some sushi right there and um, eat urchins. So this is another way we can help the kelp is eat our way out of it. Okay, Sunflower Star Lab down in Monterey Bay, California. I love visiting Monterey. There's like 12 to 14 different marine stations to visit. And this one I actually support. Uh, I've sent some financial um, support down to Sunflower Star Lab where they're rearing Pycnopodia to put back into the ecosystem to control the urchins. So I really love that um, top-down solution to restoration. Hakai, uh, of course, have uh, many outstations at Calvert Island, many scientists involved in the Hakai Institute. Down in Puget Sound, the Puget Sound Kelp um, Conservation Plan has um, been very, very active to work on um, kelp restoration techniques in Puget Sound. And I'm also in contact with them in provincial working groups, chatting to their biologists. And I've shared some of the work that I've done with their biologist, Brian Allen, and I've got feedback that um, things that I've suggested, Brian tried and is working for him too. I helped Ocean Wise uh, start a kelp nursery at PSEC in West Vancouver. They would like to do seaforestation. So they brought me in as a consultant and I worked in their lab. Um, we started up a little nursery and uh, we did a little project with the tsleil tooth Nation. We raised some kelp and we brought it out to uh, Burrard Inlet recently. 
and we out planted a bunch of kelp. I'm going to press play. Here we go. Some kelp being deployed in Gerard Inlet this spring. That's really cool. That is really Gerard cool. Gerard Inlet is quite, is quite turbid. Mm -hmm. Okay, she just mentioned Burrard Inlet is quite turbid. Yes, it is. So that's um, runoff from land, lots of mixing, and maybe the the sunlight can't penetrate through, um, might be affecting the kelp or smothering the gametophytes. But amazingly, the kelp persists under the Burrard Bridge. In uh, uh, first narrows and second narrows, there's kelp existing. So this is what we need to do. We need to go to those places where the kelp persists, uh, harvest the seed, grow it out, and put back more. Here's Steve, who I just had a phone call from. This is my friend in, in the UK. Uh, he's on the West Sussex shore and um, in Lansing. Uh, he, during COVID, he found me on social media, reached out. He said, I see you're doing some kelp cultivating. Do you think you can help mentor me or tell me more about that? And during COVID, you know, we spent so much time on our devices. I chatted to Steve every Saturday, Sunday, and um, we'd send messages back and forth. And I managed to um, basically walk him through the setup of this kelp hub that he has right here in this picture. So this is an article in The Guardian. Um, Steve was a nurse at the local hospital. He has just left his job to do kelp cultivating restor for restoration full time. So he was a free diver um, and he remembers going out. He is a free diver. He remembers going out um, snorkeling off the reefs of Bognor Reef in Sussex and his, with his grandfather, beautiful kelp forest and trawlers came through and tore it up. And uh, there's just less kelp than, than there used to be. So he was inspired by the work that I was doing and he reached out. We worked on this together. He created this kelp hub and he's been wildly successful with this project. So I'm just here to tell you that there's there's always something you can do to help nurture and restore and steward a place that you love dearly. Here's another photo from the article. Steve um, got himself a microscope. He'd phone me up and he'd ask me, should I buy this microscope? Is this the right one? What do you think? Have I got gametophytes? Have I got sporophytes? And we had such a fun time chatting back and forth. Um, and he, basically we were doing the same work at the same time. I, I love it. And so great success story. Steve Alnut, it's the Sussex Seabed uh, Restoration Project. Uh, this is a wonderful young man named Aaron Eager, another bright light. He was raised on the Sunshine Coast. His parents live in Roberts Creek. He did a, his undergrad at UBC. He headed off to Australia, New South Wales, where he did a post, uh, where he did his PhD in kelp restoration. He produced this product here, the Kelp Restoration Guidebook. It's become um, the go-to internationally, lessons learned from kelp restoration projects around the world. So Aaron was able to collate everybody's work from uh, Tasmania, New South Wales, um, Norway, uh, Korea, uh, California, Canada. And he's put together all these techniques and created a kelp forest alliance. Um, he's brought together practitioners everywhere. So I, I have to say, um, Aaron's done a wonderful job of, of creating a community of practice of people trying to do kelp restoration, sharing ideas and techniques and methods. Um, and from that, came the Kelp Forest Challenge, um, a, a roadmap um, to help us create um, a pledge, basically, an international pledge to restore kelp worldwide. Um, so there's a whole platform there. I can log on and look at other restoration projects around the world and, and see what people are doing, what works and what doesn't. Um, the Kelp Forest Challenge is basically um, a challenge to restore 200,000 hectares by 2030, 1, 000, 1 million hectares by 2040. And it also includes protections. So advocating, 
and lobbying our governments to protect kelp forests and also to put, pledge money towards restoration projects. So this is a wonderful initiative and I'm really proud of, of Aaron and all the work that he's done. Um, I recently met up with Earth Eco International again at the Impact Five conference and they reached out and asked if I would work with some of their young students, young professionals to learn about these regenerative ocean aquaculture techniques. So I'll be doing some online work with them. And there's another opportunity there for young people. This is my husband, Scott, and I off the coast of West Vancouver collecting some source material. Um, when I put this picture in, I was thinking about cutting out the houses and Scott said, no, that's important. Keep the houses in the picture because it shows that we can still have a uh, kelp forest in an urban environment as long as we can understand and steward it and take care of it. So it's very interesting that uh, along the shores of West Vancouver and even in the city of Vancouver, there's still kelp there. There's a lot of current, there's a lot of, you know, urban development, but it persists. And these are the places we have to um, go to to find resilient and tolerant kelps and, and study them closer. Um, I'd like to say thank you uh, to many people, but including my friends Ted Woodard, Joan Disney, um, Cam Crombie, Chris Campanola, um, Jeff Grognet, Neil McDaniel, Scott Hodges, Michelle Evelyn, Dave Rempel. I think I missed one. I can't quite see it. <laughs> I'm sorry if I've missed anyone. And uh, the BC Conservation Foundation who have I've been partnering with um, previously uh, on a smaller restoration project, a pilot project, and hopefully on a larger one that I'd like to tell you more about. Maybe in the q and I can get into that a little bit. But I really um, think that the community can all be involved in restoring and stewarding kelp, as well as uh, eelgrass, and all the nearshore environments that we know and love and need our attention. So I, I wanted to leave you on this one last slide of young people. I've been visiting schools. I've done about 12 different presentations to school children recently. And I was so impressed by this group of young people at a spider uh, program right in Seashelt. And there was a young man who came up to me afterwards and he said, I love this. This is so interesting. He said, I'd like to go to UBC. I'm going to study. I love microscopes. And he, he actually had some suggestions for me right off the bat. He said, have you thought about using genomics to cultivate thermally tolerant strains of kelp? Those weren't his exact words, but he knew what I was talking about, and it didn't take much for him to put two and two together. So there's so many bright lights. There's young people out there who are going to be solving our hardest problems right now with the environment. And I just want to encourage them that um, it's possible. I've seen um, I've seen good things happen. You know, when you just pay attention to the life cycle of a different animal, plant, or kelp. You know, there's good things that can happen when we understand these systems better. I'd also like to invite anyone who'd like to do a capstone project with me in order to graduate from uh, school district 46. You need to do a capstone by the end of the school year, grade 12. So I would invite anyone who'd like to do capstones, please get in touch. Thanks very much. I'm going to hand it back to Suzanne. We've done a lot of talking. That was amazing, Leanne. I love you. I mean, landing up on if anybody wants to do a capstone with me, really, we need to get that out to the schools. Are you, mm -hmm. are you, um, how are you doing that? Are you I visited 12 schools this spring. <laughs> okay. So, um, and I have to credit um, some funding received through uh, Sunshine Coast Wildlife Projects. Um, awesome. And BC Conservation Foundation uh, were awarded an NSERC Promo Science Grant. So okay. these grants help connect scientists to school kids to promote um, them to study further in sciences. Brilliant. So, yeah. um, there we go. Okay, that's amazing. Yeah, I just, wow, that there's so much going on. You know, that was an amazing presentation. Um, it's the first time that the SCCA has, you know, had somebody to come and talk about kelp. We, you know, we've learned a lot about um, eelgrass through Diane and some of the other projects and Will was here, but this is kind of like, it's new. 
<laughs> so it's it's really great. Um, it's 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 inspiring too, just to see how many people are already working yeah. on this topic and just learning about how kelp, you know, is so important for the marine ecosystems. And um, I love the help the kelp. I feel like we need like need t-shirts. Um, so I'm going to move into the question and answer part of the program now, and just a bit for the folks in the gallery. Um, if you want to ask Leanne a question, there already are a couple that I'll start with. Um, but if you want to um, uh, like take your video off and raise your hand, or if you want to use the raise hand function in Zoom, you can do that. Or you can pop a question in the chat, and I'll, I'll be keeping track of that and then feeding questions to Leanne. So the first one I grabbed was from Will. Where are we? Uh, so Will said, are there areas that would be a priority to have removal of urchins? And mm -hmm. perhaps there's a way currently, though it may be very difficult if it doesn't exist as through DFO, that larger numbers of urchins could be removed. And as a part of that comment, um, Will was talking about promoting urchin, like eating urchins to, um, yeah. You bet. Um, well, the most at-risk kelp that I've seen is, um, you know, these little pockets in Seashelf Inlet, like Neil's photo of Piper Point, for example, you know, these little pockets, there's sometimes just a dozen strands left, and then there's a million urchins right there. Like, we need to take those urchins out of the equation until Pycnopodia comes back to deal with it for us. So um, all the projects worldwide that we look at through the Kelp Forest Alliance platform, able to chat to people, um, the most successful projects are the ones that involve both uh, cultivation and, you know, outplanting with urchin um, removal. So a combination of both. And uh, so finding those little pockets that are, uh, the population is small, it's like a small little pocket left, those would be the ones to, to help and prioritize, definitely. Okay. And do you know, is there, I, I you might, might have touched on it in your presentation, but I, I think I missed it. Is there a group promoting, you know, eat the urchins, sort of, you know, helping people understand that they are a food source and that they can go and get them and do it responsibly? Is there a group doing that? Or are there restaurants promoting uni? I think all the seafood, um, the sushi restaurants have uni on the menu, but us North Americans need to um, wise up and get into it, you know? So um, I think Asian cultures are certainly aware that uni is delicious and it's a perfect thing to eat. And it's, um, it's on their uh, radar, but we need to tune in and eat those urchins. Um, I don't know. I'm, it's they're hard to get right you need diver friends or you need to go free diving free diving is really popular now maybe if there's some free divers out there or we've just had a week of extremely low tides I was out exploring on a 0.2 tide the other day and there were urchins everywhere so I don't know it's hard to get your hands on them but we should definitely look into that okay um Diane just asked do do how do you do urchin removal? Divers. Expensive. Divers. Yeah. So right. this work needs to be funded properly. Absolutely. Right. Um, that's kind of a lot of times that's the answer. Um, so, okay. So one of another question was when looking at places to plant kelp, uh, Diane noted that you looked at sandy areas and had success. Did you take into account competition with eelgrass habitat and take into account that kelps um, should be deeper than the eelgrass zone. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, I certainly would not um, plant over top of a eelgrass bed and kelp is deeper than the eelgrass. Um, so planting it out at like 40 feet, 50 feet um, is best. And it's just a, an example of experimentation just to see if we can get that kelp to persist. persist without it being grazed by the urchins. So it was just one of many things that I tried. Yeah, and yeah. When, we, when we chatted earlier, I had that question too, because I wasn't sure about how, you know, how the different species compete with each other in the marine environment. And I feel like they don't. 
I think of it as a mosaic. It's never just one and all. It's it's often patchy. Like there there could be you know a rocky outcrop, some sandy bottom, and another rocky mound. Like the the bottom of the ocean is never homogenous. It's always varied. And uh, the inlet, of course, with um, just the rocky shores and those urchins really, really take to the rock. Um, so these little pockets of sand are just, it's an opportunity for me to try and see if, if that would be a barrier to them. Think of Thormanby Island. On North Thormanby Island, there's awesome sandy beaches. You know, it's 30 feet, uh, 40 feet, 50 feet deep for a mile offshore or a kilometer offshore. It's still, it's still totally uh, shallow waters, but there's these giant nuggets or boulders of rock out there. And uh, so those traditionally had kelp on them in amongst that sandy bottom. So North Thormanby Island had a, a beautiful kelp forest. The Mercer family can tell me all about it. And that was, um, that's a, a, a feeding grounds for lots of different animals. Herring and Chinook salmon are holding off the end of the island there. If I could get kelp back there, that would, if we could get kelp back there as a community, I would love to see that happen. Very cool. Leanne, one of the other things we chatted about before, you told this story of you were, I think it was Manion Bay on Bowen and some paddle boarders came around. And can you tell that one? I love that. Well, sure. I had a test line in um, Bowen Island uh, this winter just to see, you know, how sound um, It's just on the edge, Lighthouse Park across the way. And it looks over there. I was wondering if I could cultivate in that vicinity. So a friend with a private dog, we had a kelp line in there and I went to go collect it up um, in, in the springtime and some paddle boarders came by and they saw all this kelp that I had grown and I was just gonna set it all free. And they said, could we help? I said, absolutely you can. So that technique that I demonstrated with the rock and the elastic, well, these young girls, I just set it in two minutes, explained what to do. They went back to their cabin. They got a bag of elastics from somewhere, went and got some rocks and they went to a point where there was a lot of current and they managed to get dozens of kelp back in the water at the right depth. And they knew exactly what to do. You know, it doesn't take much. So I enabled these young people to go do something that they felt like they were they were helping. So I was I was really happy to meet people like that. Anyone who wants to jump in and help, great. Yeah, it's very cool. I, and I like how it's it just sort of like organic moment and then wham, and there it was. It didn't mm -hmm. take some great, you know, no. uh, coordinating. Um, there's a whole bunch of chatter in the in the chat box. Everyone's talking about urchins and how good they are and a question around you know they're really yummy fresh off the beach but do they keep um will's talking about how to get them <laughs> okay um, cool. so, and then and then just saying like if you can get them when you go down and get them um you simply just clean them and eat them fresh right away billy's saying urchin supplier <laughs> we need to encourage someone on the sunshine coast to do yeah. that um, and I'm thinking really like there has to be a restaurant on the coast that is, you know, wants to take this up and say, hey, like we, you know, really want to promote this as a, you know, as a yummy food source, but also as a conservation conversation too. Um, let's see. Do -do -do. I, I send um, my daughter down. She's like an otter. Uh, with a glove she's got gloved hands she comes back up delivers them to me and then uh, we take scissors we flip them over where the mouth part is and we cut open the shell take it out and then inside are five packets of eggs uni eggs and we just swish swish it in water and then eat them right away mm -hmm. wow very very simple um Okay, I don't see another question in the chat. So I'm going to ask a little bit about um, Pycnopodia. Right. So, right, I mean, this, I, I had never really thought of them as, you know, the great predator, but that's a, that's a cool way to, and an accurate way to see them. I'm curious about where things are at with them, with the sea star, waste, sea star wasting disease. And you said people are starting to see a recovery. Well, I rely on my diver friends to give me those firsthand accounts that they are still present. And I was trying to describe how our geography is so varied that it's a refugia for these invertebrates. So they do hang on even despite the disease wiping through and 
you know, mass mortality, they hung on. So those are the resilient, those are the tough ones that made it and are now on the comeback. So for diver friends are, are seeing small pycnopodia making their way back a little bit larger. Um, what was I going to say? Okay, so they can walk along the bottom up to three kilometers at a time with their tube feet and they will graze little urchins, I've learned. So they're not necessarily after the big ones, but they're after the juvenile urchins. And by eating several of those throughout the day, they are keeping that urchin population at bay. Yeah. So they are a very important top predator to this whole um, kelp forest ecosystem. It's really important. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Labs just across the border in the San Juan Islands, Friday Harbor Labs, they're rearing the Pycnopodia, as well as a lab in California. I don't know of a lab in BC doing that yet, but it's probably on the list of things happening at Bamfield. Wow. Um, do you, oops, Leanne, do, sorry, there's so many questions and so many comments popping in the chat. I'm trying to. That's great. Grand had, he wrote, do you have any new local projects on the go? Oh, thank you for asking, Rand. Yes, I do. So I'm really happy to share um, that I have had a call back and received word of some funding. I've been working very hard at getting this work funded and not being um, directly involved with the academic institu institution has been difficult as a person from home doing my um, bucket science, my kitchen table science right here. Um, it's been difficult, but I partnered with NGO uh, BC Conservation Foundation, which is a wonderful organization that manages um, large projects like this to restore habitat and steward. And so um, we were successful. So I'm very happy to share that there will be some more work like this coming to the Sunshine Coast. We're very close. We're working through um, a collaborative agreement and I'll be able to share that with everybody shortly. But it is good news, Rand, and all the people who out there who have supported me over the last few years with this project. So thank you for your support, everyone. Congratulations. So community effort here. This will not be done alone. This will involve all stakeholders and uh, First Nations, scientists, NGOs, the community, the youth, we're gonna get together and we're gonna work hard at this problem. We're gonna tackle it. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Hmm. I, um, that is a perfect end note, but I'm, I'm not ready to end. I really, I feel like there's so much left and I just had to, I'm so intrigued by, the fact that the closest that 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 kelp brown kelp are more like fungi yeah isn't that crazy yeah and yeah, i wonder I could you yeah could you just give a little bit more about that because it's just okay. seems well, yeah i mean i was studying and working with kelp for almost 2 years in the last 5 years before i realized that i came across that um phylogenetic tree like a tree of life that shows where things split off you know, I also was amazed that um, Zostera marina eelgrass was originally derived as a land plant and it was went to the ocean, you know, these fun facts that you learn. But on that phylogenetic tree, I, I saw that the brown kelps broke off way, way, way earlier. Um, and they're not at all related to land plants. And then seeing it firsthand in a microscope, the zoo spores swimming with a flagella, flagella it's called, it uh, was concrete evidence. It's animal-like, it's very animal-like, and it's not at all plant-like in its reproductive history. So that that's fascinating. Yeah, the reds yeah. are not motile. The red zoo spores from red seaweeds um, don't have the same movement. So to look under a microscope and see something moving, you think animal-like. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's so intriguing. <laughs> uh, um, uh, let's see. Okay, so I feel like um, it is one o'clock. We did say at the beginning um, that we might go a little bit long. So we do have a little bit extra time with Leanne if folks want to hang around and ask some more questions. Um, 
carbon sequestration sure. is yeah that was one of the ones i was hoping you might give us a little more information about because there's you know a few different aspects to that but just like the sciencey part would be good to hear about right and and i caution anyone who you know wants to jump on the carbon bandwagon and and carbon credits because the science on cultivating kelp um, has not been completed enough to be able to issue carbon credits for this kind of thing. It is well known though that kelp uh, sequesters carbon or draws down carbon from the ocean um, even better than land plants. It actually is quite amazing at pulling the carbon out of the water. And then the fronds of the kelp, so you've got your stipe and then your frond, Think of the leaf blade as a conveyor belt. And so it is one of the fastest growing plants on earth. Um, and it's growing all the time, very rapidly. The, the stipe is reaching for the surface close to the, you know, wants the sunlight. The frond is growing rapidly and it's sloughing on the leading edge. Those tips are sloughing and that is raining down to the for to the ocean floor and being sort of buried in the sediments. And so uh, one of our top Canadian scientists, uh, Karen, Dr. Karen Philby Dexter, um, she's been doing a lot of the carbon work. And she said, you know, we're not there yet on, on carbon credits because um, it's hard for us to go down to that sediment and do coring in order to study how much carbon is being locked away. In order to capture carbon, it has to be locked away where it's not in the food chain. And um, often off the coast, kelp is being washed up and it's still in the food chains being eaten by a number of invertebrates and fish species, ducks and seabirds. Um, but to lock carbon away, it has to be buried in sediments. The, the good thing, positive thing about the coast of BC is that we have these deep, deep fjords. And so there likely is a large amount of carbon being locked away in sediments, but how would you get down there to get those core samples to study it? It's very difficult. So that, that's it. I mean, it's a positive that we have such an interesting coastline, very, very deep fjords, likely it's happening, but hard to quantify. So caution should be um, used with millennial software developers that want to get rich off carbon capture, like slow down, slow down. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's the same conversation in the forest too. And it's not as, you know, deep down and hard to get to, but it really is that, you know, we have to remember that the sequestration and storage is forever storage, yeah. not, you know, 10 years storage. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, think of the, like when we're doing this restoration work, we have to think of it holistically and that we're supporting biodiversity and we're helping animals complete their life cycle, you know, like go at it at a different way other than um, money-making, you know, it's, it's about the biodiversity. Yeah. 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 And that's always one of the challenges, right? Because it is such a hopeful thing and it's such an important part and everything gets commodified really quickly a lot of the time and can kind of get away from you. So that's where it's a sticky conversation because it's so important for the sequestration and yeah, it's, you want to be supportive. Let's see. Um, since kelp aren't vascular plants, does the sugar from photosynthesis in the kelp fronds still get shared with tissues in the stipe and hold fast? If so, how? Um, I sent some of my kelp to a UVic master's student who's going to report back on a, it's a care. I'm after the characteristics of the hold fast, the stipe, and the fronds. So when I sent her my samples, I had them all labeled, you know, hold fast type fronds. So I'll be able to answer that question soon. But I, from my understanding, yeah, there is a different concentration of different products in stipe frond. It, it does vary. Um, yeah, I wish I could answer that more. But um, yeah. You know, something that's going to come out of this is uh, bioplastics. There's people working on recipes for food packaging, bioplastics, and the two main ingredients are going to be um, alginates from kelp, which is the carbohydrate storage product, and 
cellulose from trees. And there's a recipe that's been developed at UBC, um, a PhD fellow, Jordan McKenzie, and um, to create a bioplastics industry out of those two products. Mm -hmm. yeah. Coming soon. Yeah. You could look up Bioform for that. You might get Jordan McKenzie. I think we're going to have so many links to all kinds of cool research and projects from your presentation. Um, Leanne, can you send us a link to the discussion regarding the common ancestry of brown algae and plants? I wish I could put my finger on it right now, but it takes time for me to find that. I will follow up with you. Thank you. Yeah, we, um, and that's a good, that's a bit of a good segue too, because we do on the website, on the World Oceans Day website for each one of our NEMO talks, we're, you know, adding links to all these different resources. And then we've also got a take action page. So on that page, you know, as, as, you know, we have these conversations and people are curious about how, how they can slot in and, and participate, then we want to take, you know, take that opportunity to put those um, pla places, that information about how people can take action on the take action part of the website. So I think you've given us a lot of opportunities. And the one that I have written here that I wanted to sort of go back to for a second is the kelp forest challenge the international pledge. Like I would love to, I think we should, as a follow-up for sure, we should be promoting that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you could visit the Kelp Forest Alliance website. Um, we could advocate our MPs um, provincially and federally to do more protection for kelps along the lines of rockfish conservation areas. We could be protecting kelp forests, more ocean protections. And actually I think it will play into the 30 by 30 plan to do more protection. So, you know, these hot spots of biodiversity like a kelp forest are definitely places that should be protected. And also funding needs to come to these projects to restore and rejuvenate, you know, eel grasses and kelp beds. And it is coming. It's just happening very, very slowly. So that's something over the last five years, I've realized that, you know, it takes time to build capacity, but I do see things happening and I am very, very positive by what I see. So things are coming together and there will be more action and more opportunity for sure. But anytime you get a chance to advocate for further protections of, of um, you know, biodiversity, please do. Yeah, it's your, um, you know, the Marine Stewardship Initiative, the Marine Reference yes, Guide? Yes, I do. Okay, so we had last night, we had an event and uh, we had a, uh, the film Uncharted Waters and then we were looking at the Marine Stewardship Initiative map afterwards and it's such a really great tool because you can zoom in on where you're interested in and we were focused on how sound and all the stuff that's going on there. But, you know, it goes beyond, it goes, it's like it's a Salish Seawide project. Yes. So, um, um I do there have kelp some, layer? <laughs> there is a kelp layer for um, house sound and uh, there's a special kelp in house sound called Neo agarum and I didn't have a picture in my slideshow but you remember the two I had there was Costeria costata with the five ribs and the Alaria with the one rib I should have put Neo agarum because these are the kelps that I'm learning to cultivate the marine stewardship initiative had me come out to house sound with some divers and we collected up neoagarum and I was after reproductive neoagarum, so with the source. And then um, I, I got it to release the zoo spores, but I was unable to, and I got gametophytes, but I was unable to, for the gametophytes to go through gametogenesis and reproduce into the macrophyte. So I couldn't quite close the loop on the life cycle, but it was through um, the Marine Stewardship Initiative that there's some light has been shone on um, this new agarum is habitat for prawns. So I always like to show like layers of kelp. You know, it's not just one frond down in the subtitle kelp. There's many, many layers. And the neo agarum is the nursery for spot prawns of all things. So these spot prawns that everyone loves and everyone's talking about, oh, it's not been a very good spot prawn season. Well, you know, that neo agarum needs to be looked at because it's it's contracting in its range. And so uh, this was something the 
Marine Stewardship Initiative brought up and brought to my attention that um, the nursery for spot prawns is that kelp and how sound those layers of kelp. So there's there's so much we can be doing and looking at more closely, and we need to do that. And yeah. I think making those links too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because the my mind always goes from the sea back up into the forest and down through the creeks and in that cycle. And you know, you mentioned sedimentation and and all the other sort of impacts that are coming from the land side of it too. And and how like I feel like when you talk about the spot prawns that we love to put in our mouths and eat, you know, <laughs> when we know that the kelp, like looking after the kelp and what we do on the foreshore affecting the kelp and all of that is connected, we're yeah. so much more likely to, you know, get the politicians to put money in the pots to do the conservation and to, you know, um, to facilitate that. Um, so there's, <laughs> there's quite a lot of. Um, just going to go back to the chat. Oh, Sarama. Sarama is a diver and he's, um, and so we've been showing Sarama's beautiful uh, films as part of the, our festivals for a couple of years. Um, this Living Salish Sea is this beautiful movie that he made and he's just mentioning how another aspect of this is that there's nothing more beautiful than swimming through a kelp forest. So thanks for reminding us, Sarama. Um, Paul says, taking action sounds good. I can think of a lot of shores near us um, like near the mouth of Seashell Inlet that are no longer fringed with kelp? Where and how could I drop some rocks and see if they take? <laughs> well, get in touch. Let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about that for sure. Yes. And, and your email address, just to say it out loud, it's vitalkelp at gmail.com? Correct. Okay, good. Um, uh, Will says, any divers on here who want to go collect some urchins and perhaps do a survey citizen science dive? I'm in, he's a dive master, but doesn't have many dive buddies on the coast. Um, I was literally just having a conversation with somebody this morning before the talk who's an avid diver and who's, I think, might be looking for a buddy. So, Will, we're going to have to talk after this. <laughs> okay, I'm going to share your contact info. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's William. Dot, mm, Pain environmental at gmail.com. P A N E environmental at gmail.com. Okay, moving through. Collaboration is the new inspiring item I'm seeing happen, which is so exciting, says Diane. Getting interest in all the components that make up habitats is key. It's so true because, you know, there's all these folks working on eelgrass and, you know, forage fish. And, you know, we had the talk on, Will's talk on the interconnectivity between the fish and, and, and like the little fish and the salmon and then the whales. So it's very cool. Um, yeah, Will, you uh, have to bring up the comeback of the humpback, the humpback whale, like wonderful. So there must be more of the smaller fish around the forage fish. That's exactly. Great. Will and can you be uh, sorry, I'm just tracking this. Will and can you be contacted through the SCCA? We see your message here, but we can't see your last name. Our, I, Will is posting. Everybody, what we're going to do is we're going to post both Leanne and Will's contact information on, our, um, on the page on our website that is about this specific talk. And any if you want to pop your contact information into the chat, or I think Ian's going to start loading up the chat with some of our contact info. So um, where you can contact us directly by email and then also um, our sign up to join our mailing list. And um, if you registered through the events on the World Oceans Day website, then we will have tracked you through that <laughs> as well. So I feel like, yeah, it's quarter past one. I think we're probably going to um, maybe end it here. If there's a last question or Leanne, if you had anything. I just want to thank you very much. You know, um, you're very, very welcoming reaching out beforehand and um, your team that has helped throughout all of these talks has been wonderful. And it was a little, I was a little nervous in the beginning, but um, talking to you here at the end and with the community is where it's at. So I appreciate you uh, hosting and doing such a great job, Suzanne. Thank you. Aw, thank you. Thank you yeah. so much, Leanne. 
Um, and with that, I guess I want to just say thank you to everybody that has participated in this festival and in the Nemo talks. We've learned so much. And, and the talks themselves, you know, we're putting them up on YouTube and putting them on the website. And these are resources that we're going to have forever, right? So please share them around and encourage people to get in touch and get involved and, you know, click the links and sign, sign up for engagements and, um, and activities. Um, and obviously, too, from, you know, from the SCCAs, and we're so grateful to all the folks who've participated with us and given of your time and um, just we, you know, obviously couldn't do this without you. You're a huge part of it. It's so inspiring to hear and just connect with all the folks doing all this amazing good work, because sometimes, you know, it's hard to it's it's hard to remember that all these good things are going on when we just see the negative stuff. So. This is a really important part of the conservation conversation. It's just learning about the, the good work happening and, and the changes that are being made, whether the, there are, they are slow and there's a lot to, there's a lot to do, but it is happening. So um, we, let's see, so we don't have any talks left, but we still have amazing films up on the website. Um, Ian, I think is posting all the links in the chat. Again, we've got some, feature films that will be up on the website for, you know, they just stay there. Please go check out Sarama's beautiful film. Billy Carroll um, has, she's curated this amazing um, collection of short films that relate to all of these different topics and the Nemo talks. Um, and yeah, I hope everybody will go and, you know, keep, keep visiting and keep watching and, and get involved. And again, I'm just gonna say huge thanks and a shout out to our sponsors, District of Seashell, SCRD, Sunshine Coast Credit Union, Rhizome Up Media and the Green Film Series. Billy Carroll is amazing. And we just like, we're so happy to work with you. Um, Diane Sanford um, and the for um, Friends of Forage Fish, Angela Kronig and our working group. Um, and I, I gotta keep saying it this year, we actually got um, we got the Gibson's Marine Education Center to jump in on the festival and they hosted a bunch of events and a movie in the park. And so, you know, we're, we're building this collaboration too. So that's really inspiring. Um, so I'm going to leave you all with that and say, you know, thank you so much for celebrating our oceans this week for the, for the festival. And we'll uh, please join our, our mailing list and we'll send you more information about all this stuff. And thank you. Bye.